academic with the Office of the Party of the University of Cybersecurity Hub. It's a group of 35 or more academics who focus on cybersecurity and privacy, AI, a whole range of new technology and risks for society, all the way from hardcore cryptographers through to computer scientists, here in the business school, through the lawyers, even psychologists. So we're a broad spectrum interdisciplinary group who are trying to help uh, people uh, around the world, particularly in Australia, to have the benefits of the internet whilst minimising the harms that can flow from it. So I'm here today to talk about one of the projects that we are doing uh, at the moment, which uh, we have called Antiport, um, for the want of a better name. Uh, we're, we're still picking up a better name for it yet. Um, and we're trying to help Australians protect their identity on their mobile phones. So a quick uh, interview, a quick overview, sorry, of what I will cover today. Um, I'll talk about briefly about what is boarding, the aims of our project, who's on it, uh, who our partners are. Um, I'll take you into a website that we have built to try to educate the public about this. We'll have a quick look at that. We don't have enough time to go through it in, in full. Um, and then I'll take you into some insights from focus groups that we have done uh, from with seniors trying to improve the uh, basic website. Um, and then also the federal government's response to this problem. Can you give me up the back, Cliff? Yes. Yes. Yeah. There's no microphone here, so it's pretty small. Okay. So you will have mobile phones, I see. Yes. And you will have a telecommunications service provider, <laughs> someone like Telstra or Optus or Vodafone or something like that. So you rely upon them to provide you with a signal so that you can make phone calls, access the internet, etc. through your online banking. And you can ship between one telecommunication service provider to another telecommunication provider relatively easy. And the government has actually mandated that to increase competition between telecommunication service providers. Because otherwise you could imagine that Telstra might want you to have to do 10 handsprings, 4 push-ups, <laughs> and 20 sit-ups before they'll let you leave them. They would like to keep you as sticky as possible. So the government said, make it easy for people to shift from one provider to another. The problem with that is that criminals have latched onto this as a way to make money from you and to steal your identity. And that we have, one of the ways they do that is through of your mobile phone. So, Porting is good, unauthorised porting is bad. This is when someone impersonates you, rings up your telecommunications service provider, perhaps after they have stolen some mail from your home, or they've rung you up and said, hi, I'm from the tax office, you owe a tax debt, or this is Microsoft technical support. Have any of you ever received those calls? Yeah. Yeah. You're savvy enough, hopefully, to realise that those are scammers. Not everyone is. That's one of the problems. People are trusting to have a, a naive view of the world, which is a nice thing, but it's dangerous when the risks have gone up and your mental model of how the world works continues to think it's low risk. So after you might have given one of those criminals on that phone call access to your computer, and they've told you click on this link, and you have let them install a remote access trojan, or some malware of your computer. The criminals, if they want to get in and steal your money, they face a problem. They might know your username and their password, but your bank is aware of this. The bank is requiring you to enter a code that they send you via SMS. So many of you probably have that with your bank. And some of you might have a token as well that gives you a random number. So this is what we call two-factor authentication. So your username and password is one thing, then the second factor is something else, like the number they send. So the criminals want to get the second factor authentication code. And one of the ways they can do that is to port your phone. So they ring up Telstra or Optus, Vodafone, whoever, pretend to be you, get your number transferred to a phone they control. So then when you go into your online banking, or they, if they're already on the computer, log into your account, and the bank sends that security code, it doesn't go to you. It goes to the criminal. The criminal types it in, the criminal empties your bank account or your super fund, takes out a credit card in your name, buys a property in your name with a mortgage. All manner of evil things can occur. 
And you don't find out about this until they've sold the property or racked up the credit card debt. Some of them will even pay the minimum payments for a few months on the credit card, and then they walk away. And then suddenly you start getting chased by debt collectors. And you have to prove it wasn't you. And some people have lost thousands of dollars, millions of dollars even. There was a gentleman in the United States who lost $24 million because he had cryptocurrency, uh, bitcoins, and the wallet was attached to his phone. And he had two-factor authentication. Once the criminals got that and ported it, they were able to bypass his security measures and they stole all of his money. So he's suing, as a typical American, he's suing the uh, telecommunications provider that he was with, which was at and I think, for $128 million. So much larger charge. So um, I don't know how successful he will be. So, yes? So there's two phones with your phone number. You've still got no, your... No, your phone doesn't work anymore. No. It can connect to Wi-Fi, but what you would see is an SOS message. Right. So sometimes if you go into a parking garage or an underground yeah. location or a tunnel or something, you see you're not getting any signal and your phone might say SOS. Mm. So one way that you can monitor whether this has occurred to you is if you ever see that on your phone, go back to an area where you would expect to get signal, up above ground, outside of a building, etc. And then see if it persists. If it still remains SOS and you can't make any calls, then you need to get in touch with your bank, etc. Or simple is ask one of our friends to ring our number and they won't be able to ring us. Well, they may be able to ring the criminal, they won't get Yeah, then, then, then that person won't be able to ring us. Simple story. Ask your will husband or partner to ring you. Physical device. It will go through to someone else. So, this is the problem that we are trying to educate the public about. So our project here is, um, you know, we can't produce a technical solution ourselves because businesses have to implement it and you have to use it. So we can't do the design, but there are other people who are working on solutions. And what we want to do is to help to educate the public about this problem. Because we don't want you to fall victim to this. The police don't want you to fall victim to this. Your banks don't want you to fall victim. So we're trying to advance literacy uh, to minimise the impact of financial fraud, to reduce the amount of time and stress. People who suffer this, one of my colleagues on this project, he had his, his phone ported, his identity stolen. It took him weeks of stress to try to solve. So some people it takes months. It can be an immense problem. So there's five of us on the project. That's me, uh, my colleague, Francis Stephen Shrook, from he's, uh, a, a expert in uh, finance. We have a, an expert in cryptography, Professor Christopher Dosh, who is the director of the Cybersecurity Hub, and we have our two research assistants, Fabiola and Linda. And we have been uh, supported with money from Extra and from the Cybersecurity Hub and the University. And our partners, special thank you to the Australian Seniors Club, uh, the Computers Club Association, because we've done some focus groups with seniors. And that's been very useful for us to try to improve the effectiveness of this communication to the public. One of the challenges as academics is we're used to writing for academic audiences. We write, it seems perfectly clear to us. <laughs> Not necessarily clear to everyone else. So that's where going out and testing it in the real world is good. So I've been talking about this thing. Let me actually see, hopefully this will work. Hello. Yeah, let's see. Computer's working. <laughs> Trusting the internet here. Yes, here we go. We've got our cycle. So this is as it looks at the moment. Um, we have, if you're worried that you've been scanned, this, this is you know, the emergency thing, because we figure a lot of people will come to this website when they're getting the SOS message. So the first thing that appears, the nice thing, uh, you know, signs, uh, and if you've got the problem, click here for help. Straight to go. Um, I'll just close that down. So what is the SOS like? How do we know that my phone is on SOS signal or not? So when you look at your phone, so if I pull my phone up at the moment, I see 4G plus. Yes. When that drops down and you see SOS only, and you try. So the word SOS comes there, is it? Yeah. 
So SOS you. is the old-fashioned save our souls from the days of dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 Morse code. So you know, people on desert islands who are you know, lost and set it out in stones. And, I'm in, a, I'm in a panic, I cannot you know, save my life, I need help. So that will come up, and, but it's only a very small print on your phone. Thank you. And when you try to make a call, you can't make any calls. So if you've excuse got, me, is that different to the zero with the cross saying you've got no reception? Well, that's a different thing. So one is that there's no reception, the other is you've got reception, but you can't make any calls. So if you take the SIM out of your phone, and you turn your phone on, your phone can connect to a tower, but you can't make a call. You might see it says emergency only, SOS only. So, uh, yeah, so we've got a- It replaces your 4G sign. Yeah. So, here, uh, different phones will have different things, so I can't say categorically will always look like one eye. <coughs> so, our idea here is to have some, some your basic information, explaining the problem, at this extent, it's getting about 20% of people during their lifetime. Is the rate of the problem. 5.8 million lost just in New South Wales in 2016. So, and the criminals will sometimes, if you realise this is occurring, contact your telecommunications service provider to get it blocked. They will ring up again. They keep trying. You can end up with a bit of a battle going back and forth to try to keep the criminal off your your system. So, uh, can I just clarify that in order for the criminal to want to port, illegally port your phone, they must already have some kind of identity documents of yours that they want to then do? Typically, yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So because it's not always the case. Some might want to port your phone because they want to do something else with it. But typically it's one step in a chain. So if we can block this step, then we can better protect them. The problem with, and the reason why the criminals are doing this is because SMS is not a secure form of two-factor authentication. An SMS code is a bit like someone writing a password on a postcard yes. and dropping it in the mail. SMS is not encrypted between one party and another. It's sent in plain text. More advanced criminals are doing an attack on what's called the SS7 network. So this is an internal network used by the telecommunication service providers around the world to coordinate with each other. Law enforcement like the SS7 network because they get access to it in intelligence health, uh, agencies and they can just monitor everyone their SMS traffic. And they do it. But criminals are also breaking into it and monitoring SMS codes. They can redirect them, they can intercept them, read them, etc. So two-factor authentication is good SMS by two-factor authentication is weak and dangerous. So this is one of the things we're trying to educate the public about because it's more demand that will help to alter the choices that businesses make about what form of two-factor authentication they offer. There are various tools you can have, you have YubiKeys, Google Authenticator, and various other tools that are more secure two-factor authentication than SMS. Unfortunately, our government system asks your travel license number, your home address, your telephone number, passport number, easy. For anybody, I can get in 10 days. Yep. So the, um, the material, uh, the SMS is not um, secure, it's convenient though, and that's why so many businesses use it. So part of what we're doing on this website is to help to um, you know, obviously protect your clients, is to provide information to businesses to encourage them to use more secure alternatives. Because there's two parties to this. There's you as consumers and the businesses that you choose to use. And if you start to choose to use businesses that give you more secure two-factor authentication, and not SMS, then more businesses will change their behavior. So, um, so how does it happen? Various information we've got here. I'm just conscious of the time. We've got a few done a so far. Um, so we will be uh, launching this um, 
website once we have improved it even further. That's why we're doing the focus groups to get guidance from people um, about what has worked well on it, what hasn't worked well on it, um, how we can make it easier to understand, uh, etc. So, risk. So we often see social media users being attacked, in particular because to, to, to port your phone, they need your name, your date of birth, and your address. Stealing your mail gives you the name and the address. Who of you on social media has your birthday there? So everyone can wish you a happy birthday. No. Yeah, three things. Yeah. So, very wise idea to put a fake date of birth on your social media pages, because it makes it harder for criminals to steal your identity. And that can be done. Those three things are so simple, but people divulge them so publicly. Can you repeat those again? Your name, your address, your name of birth. I, I asked uh, my service provider to stop wishing me happy birthday because I wondered whether it was illegal to give them points and uh, their details. Well, if you're going to a bank or the tax office, yeah, you've got to give them your real date of birth. Facebook, on the other hand, does not have to have your real date of birth. But they only need to know that you're over 13, which I assume everyone in the room here is. <laughs> So can you change it after it's already on Facebook? Oh, yes. It depends. Yes. Um, yes, it depends. In answer to that question, yes, you can. If you go into settings and use your eyes and find it, yes. somewhere there in yes. settings, yes. it's got your profile, and in your profile have your date of birth. Get rid of it completely. Often there's a little pen symbol beside it, that's the edit symbol. Yes. Then you can go and change it. Yep. Um, um, do you in your opinion, do you think that uh, companies that offer uh, a subscription service where they will monitor whether someone else has uh, applied for credit in your name or uh, those sorts of things, do you think they are those sorts of services are worthwhile? Okay, so a couple of things. One is you can do a free credit check yourself once a year right. through the credit agencies. Most people don't bother doing it, but you can. If you are particularly concerned, so if you're expecting that you don't need to take out many loans or things like that, you can actually put a credit freeze on your file so that no new credit can be taken out in your name. Right. So that's one strategy you can use. Now it means if you apply for a new credit card, you'll be rejected until you remove the freeze. Right. Or if you apply for a reverse mortgage, you'll be rejected. Or a holiday loan or whatever. So there's that to keep in mind. What, what side is that? Uh, there's a variety of different ones. There's Vita Advantage. Um, so the, the credit bureaus, um, these are private bodies that run a business of doing credit checks, uh, giving you a credit score. There's a number of them, no single one site. Um, so a credit freeze can help. Um, those credit check services, if you've been a victim of identity theft or many, can be useful. You often see them being offered if you're a victim of a data breach. So you've given your data to PageUp, for example, you're applying for a job, and there's a large PageUp breach, and hundreds of thousands of Australians had their uh, personal information, their CVs and job applications leaked. So you know, some of the, t the response to data breaches is often to offer those affected a credit monitoring service. So they can have some value. Um, Again, these businesses, they will market the fear factor for the purposes of incentivizing you to pay them. It's so because I did something silly at one stage. I did sign up, it's only $5 a month or something, yeah. where they, what they claim they will monitor, they're monitoring my identity documents to see whether someone else um, applies for credit in my name and then they will tell me as soon as that happens. So if, if you are able to afford that easily, and you, as long as it's a legitimate company, Oh, there are scammers out there who oh, will put yeah, out yeah. Yeah. credit monitoring services. <laughs> <laughs> so go with the official credit bureaus. Are you familiar with Equifax? Equifax, yes. Oh, yeah. So they have a massive data breach as well. So the problem with your credit monitoring company has a data breach. Yeah. This morning I received an SMS. Contact so and so lawyer and they gave their address HTTPS and some some bit and feet, all the things. I have never dealt with that lawyer. Now, 
I have read it. No, I am saying, am I legally bound to respond to that message? No, no, no. no. If because it could be from government agency. How would you know? Exit this one asking. Yeah, you cannot trust any SMS that you receive that it is official. I didn't bother. It doesn't mean that you distrust all of them, but it means verify and verify not by clicking on the link. Exit. Right? By going to the you know, a search engine and looking up the name of the business and finding out who they are, finding out their telephone number, contacting them, and seeing with us. I haven't got that many seconds in my life spare to waste after that, so I simply deleted it. <laughs> so yeah, the problem is because these are so low cost, because internet voice over IP calls are low cost, because SMSs are so low cost, criminals around the world have realized. Rather than sending some 300 pound gorilla down the street to beat up old shop owners to convince them to hand over money, they can go out and attack the average public around the world. We're far lower risk to them of being caught. And because the crossing of border makes it much harder to capture. And what they're looking for is the most gullible people. So if you can find the one in a millionth most gullible person in Australia. There's 25, 26 people that you can rip off. Okay. And that's what they look for. Thank you. So, um, yeah, anyway, I, rather than talking endlessly about the website, let's go back to the presentation. <laughs> and, uh, some insights, because this is you know, feedback. So we've had uh, four focus groups. Um, this is only the feedback relating to the seniors, so I think being an audience of seniors, probably more interested in what seniors have to say about the site than university students. So 95% um, of the people we uh, had as focus group participants said that the site made them more aware of their risks of their online ID being stolen, so we're happy for that. 70% um, said they plan to change what they did to protect their own online identity and phone security. So that's a really good thing. A portion either don't care or have already done it. So that's it. Scores out of five, um, increased my awareness of security risks quite high. Um, I recommend to my friends and family was a little bit lower, so uh, that gives us ideas that we need to improve the website further. And that's the next stage of our project, is having gone out and got the feedback from our focus groups, we then want to take into account not necessarily everything that everyone told us, but many of the things that were suggested. Because we thought we'd made it as good as we could, but we knew that when you take anything out in the real world, you find out that your idea of what is best is not everyone else's. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are doing it. Um, written feedback that we got from people. A lot of people are completely unaware of this problem. Many of the people in the room here, when you walked into this room, you may have been unaware that this was a problem, and that our society is facing. And that says that we've got to raise awareness. Unfortunately, most of us are rationally ignorant of the great many risks that we face. Because we just don't have enough time in the day to, to pay attention to them all. And we'd be paranoid, scared, curled in the corner if we paid attention to every risk. So we live in oblivion for many of the risks that we face. Denial's not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> However, when those risks rise substantially, and we think they're low risk, but now they're medium to high risk, it's a good idea to start paying attention to them. So um, that's what we're seeing people realizing, the risk of their is greater than I realized, which is one of our problems. People were saying the warnings were realistic. <coughs> we're not just wanting to scare people. If scaring people activates a primitive part of the brain, the reptilian brain. And that's a powerful emotional uh, effect. But what we want to do is activate your rational brain. Because that's where decision making, wise decision making occurs. By giving you information about actions that you can take to reduce the risk that you're exposed to. There, we've uh, got on the website currently a quiz that was from the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner about um, identity theft generally. We are building a, a game to go on the website at the moment, um, which will just be an interactive few clicks. You know, it'll give you scenarios and you can make choices and those will help you to understand was that choice a lower risk or a higher risk choice. So that's one of the things we're still 
build it. Um, some people said older people need slower information. You know, some of the, one of the things was that uh, at the very beginning of the website, we had the uh, sort of a, a rotating set of instructions or some recommendations. And they were saying uh, that was moving through too quickly. So you know, little things that we have to adjust. Um, we need to keep them precise, easy to understand, simplify the indexes and uh, menus, and less words, more pictures. So, Interestingly, and this is a wall of text I don't expect you to read, but the federal government has recognized this as a problem. Whilst some of the major telecommunications service providers have allowed you to contact them to set up a, a PIN or a password, so that if anyone ever wanted to transfer the phone SIM from you to someone else, then they would have to give that PIN or that code, that phrase. Not all of the smaller telecommunications companies have done that. So the minister has now said you must all do it as telecommunications companies, which is a good thing. From um, what day? Sorry? Is that in now or is it from a certain day? That was a statement on the 16th of October, but it takes time to implement. So it's coming. What do you currently have to do to transfer it for your um, supplier? What do you have to tell them? Name, date of birth, address. I see. And phone number. And somebody wants to have that first. Yep. Some of them will go in person in store and try and impersonate you as well. A lot of them do it over. They will claim it's an emergency, you know, they're trapped and near a bushfire or something, and blah, blah, blah. Right, to try Because the health call center people, they are recruited and selected because they're people pleasers. They don't get a job if they're grumpy. They get a job if they're happy to help. And so the criminals will exploit that. And this person is going, oh, sure, let me help you. And what they're doing is not helping. You, the criminal. So that's uh, basically it. I mean, we've still got a couple of minutes left. Are there any questions that you have? Yes. You listed a number of other authentic authentication processes yep. that you can ask your provider. I missed them. Can you repeat uh, them? Okay. Please? So there's. Um, we don't want to say that you should.